On this edition of Around BCC, we look at the college's role in helping students succeed in taking college-level courses. BCC could soon be seeing a bump in resources from next year's state budget, and our Alumni of the Month used BCC to help in her role as a city councilor. Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Thibault. We have entered the month of March, that means hopefully warmer weather ahead, and also we're just about halfway through the spring 2013 semester at Bristol Community College. Bristol Community College, of course, is known for its open door policy for any student who wants to uh, better themselves through higher education can come to the doors of Bristol Community College. But when students get here, especially students who have high school diplomas, they come to the college sometimes needing remedial help, especially in math and in English. Well, we're going to talk about some of the developmental courses that BCC uh, has uh, devised for students to make sure that they're ready for college and also their post-college careers. I'm joined today by the Acting Vice President of Academic Affairs, Greg Satharis, and also two uh, uh, instructors here at BCC, Beth Donovan, instructor of math, and Deb Anderson, who is a professor of English. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Greg, let me start with you. Um, the issue of uh, developmental education and getting students help with their coursework before they begin college is nothing new, and it's not just a problem here in Massachusetts or in BCC, correct? No, in fact, it's a national, it's a national crisis that's going on. Approximately 22% of students nationwide who enter college are ready for college level course and require no remedial or developmental coursework at all. Uh, and here in Massachusetts it's about the same and here at BCC we're about the same as the other community colleges. A large number of our students who come in uh, do need developmental work prior to college level work. Now what does that mean? Um, I mean it must be disappointing when you know students come in they're expecting to get right into their coursework, they're looking to get their degree, looking to, to get their career started and then they find out that, well, you can't take any courses in your degree yet because you need help in math or in English. So uh, what's been the case at BCC in, in helping these students? We'll talk about some innovative ways of doing it better. Well, that's certainly a problem, and it's certainly a discouraging factor for many students who come in. Uh, if they're a Massachusetts resident, uh, if, and they're, if they're coming directly from high school, many of them have just gotten out of high school, have passed the MCAS, so that they feel, yes, they think hey, I'm, all set. I'm, I'm, I'm going to BCC, I'm, I'm going to college, and then they come and they are tested and find out that they're not quite ready. And it's not just the community colleges where this is an issue. This happens uh, in the state university right. system and also in, in the UMass system as well. Uh, but when they come here, uh, we do offer, being the community college, part of the role of community colleges statewide is that we uh, offer the, the, the primary source of developmental coursework, that we are, primary, we are the primary more so than the uh, UMass system and the state right. universities responsible for offering developmental coursework, and we do so in a variety of uh, in a variety of ways and change ever changing ways. Now, in terms of um, when students are tested, what are the the baselines? Are they state guidelines that students need to hit in terms of whether they they need that remedial help or not? Absolutely. In mathematics, there are state guidelines. There's a state mandated test. We use a test called the a nationally normed test called the AccuPlacer, uh, and we give both an arithmetic and an a elementary algebra test. There's also a college algebra test that is given uh, in some of the state universities uh, in the UMass system as well. But there are state guidelines. We go on the algebra test by two different cutoff scores uh, mandated by the Department of Higher Education. Mm. All right, let's talk to, to Beth and Deb now. Beth, let me start with you. Um, math is probably the, the greatest need in terms of students coming in. They, they seem to lack the skills in, in math. And some, some what we may consider some basic math skills, students may have learned in high school, but when they come to college, they may not have had it for a while. They, they need some help in getting going. Talk a little bit about what has been done in the past at BCC, as far as you know, in terms of getting students prepared to improve their math skills. Well, over the last three years, we've um, gone to a computer-aided model, and over this past year, we piloted um, 
what we call the modularized curriculum, where our curriculum is actually broke into modules and it allows our students to um, test out of material they already know, so they're not reviewing material that they need, but learning and focusing mainly on the material that they do need. Okay. It not only allows the student to work at, a, a, at a, their own pace, so it is a self-paced course, but it allows them to complete more than one class if they're, if they're so inclined. And, it helps to shorten the pipeline. It can really allow our students to get through their developmental sequence and not lose that enthusiasm for school and to excel later on in their college classes. Well, let me ask you about that. In, in the past, students had to take specific classes, maybe two, three developmental courses yes. before they, even, they can even start their, their coursework for their major. Now, what's changed, as you say, is students, it's sort of self-paced, as mm -hmm. you said, so students can go a little quicker mm -hmm. if they're so inclined. Mm -hmm. The question I have is, how does that impact um, an instructor in the classroom working with all these students that may be at different points in their advancement? Because we're in a developmental classroom, our class size is limited to 22. Okay. So um, we do have that smaller classroom. It's very easy. It's much more of a hands-on classroom where you may have one student in one topic, another student in another topic. But it's more of a one-on-one -on -one tutoring aspect in a room. So the student gets a very like self-contained plan and it's very it's just for the student so you can hit on exactly what the student is in need of in the classroom so and sometimes there's two or three students working and they're all in the same area and they're all kind of stuck you can pull them aside and give like a mini lecture in a classroom but it allows a student to excel in those areas that he or she is very good at and while well, at the same time seeking the remediation they need in only the areas that truly is causing a problem for the student. Now on average students who need remedial math help, how many courses on average do they need? Is, is it like two or three? Is it more? Is it more closer to one? What's, what's Typically the... our students need at least one course. Um, they usually need to complete, um, it, depending on whether or not they test out of the arithmetic course, they do need to complete an introductory algebra course. If you're going into a STEM field or elementary education, you will need to complete three develop the, a potential of three developmental courses. So often our students could go over an entire year before they would see an actual college level class and that gets very difficult for them. And you mentioned STEM, that's science, technology, Engi engineering, engineering and, and mathematics. Ma mathematics. Yes. I got it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so those students obviously would need more, more math to begin with. Yes. So if they're already behind the curve, mm -hmm. they would need more help. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there any specific, specific aspects in math that students seem to lag behind than others? Not necessarily specific topics, but definitely in algebra, a lot of times I think it's um, more of a confidence issue with our students. Once they start to get into the material again, they're, oh, I had this, I remember this. And it's, it's kind of building back on that confidence of, I don't, you know, I hear in the classroom, oh, this is difficult, or I don't remember how to do this, or I, I'm not good at math. But once you get the students in working and they can see that immediate reaction with the computer-aided model that it says, good job, or excellent work, or you know, you can, they can see their progress, they get very excited and they, they're happy to complete a course. And they're happy to do more work. So it's not just remediating them, it's also building confidence in the classroom and some study skills. And that is one of the reasons we've opened the Developmental Math Center, so the students have about close to 40 hours a week our tutoring room is open just for developmental math. Mm. We do service over 2,000 students every semester so right. we have a large population of students that really do need the math help. Alright, let's move to English reading and writing. Deb, uh, what's, what's been the problem in terms of students needs in your area? Um, well, uh, students come in and they test in reading, mm -hmm. uh, in a, a statewide test much like the math. Um, and writing, they test uh, on a writing sample that is uh, based on a prompt developed by members of the English department. Um, and a good number, at least over 30 percent each semester, need this sort of reading and or writing uh, remediation. Um, I think the, you know, like the math department, we've, we're trying a new pilot this semester. Um, we're trying to look at uh, integrating and accelerating the process for students mm -hmm. so they don't get discouraged. And so instead of redoing things they worked on in earlier grades, they're actually practicing college level work because that's what they need to do, be prepared for college level work. Mm -hmm. um, so the integrated model uh, is appropriate for students who need both work in English, the writing piece, as well as in reading. 
So rather than taking two separate courses, developmental reading and developmental writing, now they're taking one six credit course that integrates those skills. Mm -hmm. And it's really a paradigm shift. It's more of a critical thinking course and critical reading and writing than just taking those two courses and sort of mushing them together. Right. Um, and the English uh, is for students who need the developmental English. And what they do is they pair up with a college level course. So they take both at the same time mm -hmm. as uh, co-rex. Um, they're in a uh, regular college level course, both with students in the developmental class and students who just placed into the English 101 class or the regular uh, college level class. And the um, developmental course serves as a support for them. So the instructor works in a lot of um, sort of small group ways and individual right. ways to help support those students with the assignments that they're doing in the college level class. So when they finish, uh, the semester, they'll have the college level course sort of under their belt, as well as all the scaffolding and extra support that they needed to accomplish that. Mm. Now, are there any specific aspects of reading and writing that students seem to be lacking? I asked Beth this question on math. Is there any specifics that you, you know see what? of students coming it in? It varies. I think um, when it comes to writing, um, you know, I think students always tend to be worried about their grammar, uh, mechanics, things like that. And sometimes those things are an issue, and that can be handled well in the individual, in a more individualized setting, in a smaller setting, um, where instructors can really look at the student's writing because that's where students are going to benefit most from that kind of help. Um, but you know, it really can vary. Sometimes it's organization. Um, in English 101, the freshman level writing class, um, students have to do work with research, so they have to be, you know prepared at a certain level to you know, evaluate sources, um, to be able to read well to do that, mm -hmm. and to think critically about um, other people's writing in order to synthesize those ideas for their own writing. Mm. Greg, let me come back to you. One of the important things that needs to be addressed here is that students who take developmental courses, they're paying for those courses, mm -hmm. they're taking those courses, they don't go toward the credits they need to graduate in their specific major. And that could be a deterrent for some students. And I know there have been some uh, studies done that students who take developmental courses, oftentimes they don't complete their college education for a number of reasons. That's right. The factors that Beth brought up about you know, being discouraged and, and Deb brought out the same thing. But uh, a big part of it also is financial aid. Financial aid can be used to pay for these developmental courses. But then when a student gets to the point of completing their degree, their financial aid may have run out. So tell That's us a little right. about that discouragement factor. Well, there, there's definitely there's a limit to the financial aid. And, right. and so, so many students can get into de the developmental sequence and get lost. There right. are very damning statistics nationwide and here in Massachusetts. And we've run the statistics here at BCC as well. And they're very similar that show that students who start in developmental math uh, do not have a great chance of succeeding. And part of the reason for that is that they're what, what we refer to as exit points. Uh, in the traditional system where a student may need, let's say, two developmental math courses before taking the college level course, uh, they, play, they come in all excited, they place into developmental math, they may choose not to enroll in that developmental course at all. Then they may not pass that developmental course. And even if they do, they may not then register for the next one, right. pass the next one, and then finally register for that college level course. So part of the uh, computer aided instruction model that we're trying to do is, is eliminate those exit points so that a student comes in, gets into the developmental sequence, and gets the support immediately and can continue straight through the sequence to the college level math course without hitting any of those exit points. So that's a big part of what we're uh, what we're trying to do to sort of get rid of some of that discouragement. They come in, they get immediate feedback. Beth talked about how students get feedback right in the, com right in the software. They will get back, if they do something right, they'll get back a message saying, you know, great job, good right. job, the teacher's there to give them the kind of uh, support and encouragement. So hopefully we're trying to cut down with a computer-aided instruction model the discouragement factor, but also cutting down on those exit points. One of the, the questions that, that come to my mind as, as sort of a, a layman in this process, I'm not an educator, is that there's a disconnect, and I'm not here to criticize uh, public schools or high schools, but there's a disconnect because, as you said, Greg, students pass MCAS, they graduate, they have a high school diploma, 
Then they come here and there's, there's, there's still things that, that they're lacking. Is there, are there discussions between the higher ed community and public schools, high schools, to talk about how to bridge that gap better? Absolutely. There, there are national conversations going on. Uh, there's a, there's a, a new nationwide curriculum that's going to be used called the Common Core that will be used, okay. uh, implemented within the, ne the next couple of years. And it will actually, in Massachusetts, it's already implemented. The Massachusetts Core, uh, core Frameworks already include the Common Core in them. As we move forward, uh, there is also going to be a new assessment in the high school, actually in the entire K-12 to system, okay. where students are assessed. So in Massachusetts, ultimately, let's say in five years down the road, if all goes well with this new assessment, it could be that we're going to be seeing MCAS slowly disappearing, and this new assessment, which in Massachusetts is called PARC, uh, coming into play. Now, the, the thing about the PARC assessment um, is that currently the MCAS assessment is not intended to assess whether or not the student is college ready. Mm -hmm. The new assessment is intended to assess not only have they successfully com completed the junior level course uh, that they're taking, but also if they do, are they ready for college level. So in a perfect world, that new assessment down the road, if it goes well and tests well, uh, will be used to determine if a student is college ready and therefore uh, limiting the number of students, decreasing the number of students who will actually be testing on our campus. Is BCC also having discussions with other state public higher educational institutions on how they're doing developmental ed and maybe you can learn from each other on how to do this better? Absolutely. There, there, there are many statewide initiatives over the, uh, established over the last couple of years uh, going on here. BCC has active participants in those. And also, uh, in the past year, we've been also um, in the cities of New Bedford and Fall River mm. where we have our two largest campuses. Right. We have been having math and English faculty meeting with math and English faculty and administrators from the K-12 systems to work on those issues of alignment. And there's also, you had mentioned before we started, some talks on the state level as well on, on how to better organize um, and how to better develop these developmental courses, the Board of Higher Education, you, you're part of a, a working Yes, yeah, specifically right now, I'm a former math faculty member. I'm on a, develop, a Department of Higher Education Developmental Math Task Force, and what we're looking at is revamping our statewide policy, including the policies that we use here at BCC regarding uh, the using the AccuPlacer cutoff scores, suggesting methods like, for instance, the uh, computer-aided instruction model, and another model that we haven't talked about yet, the co-requisite model. One of the other things that's been shown nationwide, both in reading, writing, and in math, is that students who are relatively close to placing into college-level course frequently can do very well if you just place them directly in the college-level uh, course with some co-requisite support. So in the math department currently, we're we are in the process of developing a co-requisite model for introductory statistics so right. that a student who was relatively close but otherwise would not have been allowed to take the college level course will be starting in the fall allowed to take the college level course with some co-requisite supports along the way and what those supports are are currently right. being developed in the math So department. it looks like BCC is ahead of the curve in some respects. We talked about the co-reqs in, in English and in reading and, and writing. It looks like math may go to the same way and hopefully that will get those students to stay in the pipeline, if you will, so Absolutely. students will complete those courses and also uh, go forward with their college education. Greg, Beth, Deb, thank you for joining, joining me. It's a great discussion, and it's an important one. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Keith. We'll have more of Around BCC right after this. Welcome back. During a presentation last month to state legislators, BCC President Dr. John Sprague laid out the college's plans for the new fiscal year, which begins July 1st. Under the budget plan submitted last month by Governor Patrick, the state's higher educational institutions will likely see an increase in funding next year. If passed in its current form, BCC would receive an increase of $2.3 million. Dr. Sprague says such a hike will result in an increase in full-time faculty. In the years that I've been here, we've gone from 99 full-time faculty to 135 
full-time faculty. And that's with, and you know what the economic uh, situation has been over these last 10, 12, 13 years. So uh, I'm very proud that we've been able to do that. Uh, and uh, you know, that's our most important product. A college is only as good as its faculty. And uh, uh, we have an outstanding faculty and we want to add to the uh, bolster the ranks of our full-time faculty. In addition, instructional support, uh, we need to get that support services, uh, get those support <laughs> services out uh, to, our, uh, uh, to our students. State Senator Michael Roderick says the local legislative delegation will take the governor's proposal to heart when it makes its budget decisions. As the governor makes these proposals, it is the responsibility of us to dispose of those and to deliberate those. And we will have a lot of discussions in the forthcoming months of trying to balance all these proposals and ensure uh, that the region that we represent here in southeastern Massachusetts remains a tremendous place to, to live and to work and to raise a family. And Bristol Community College is at the heart of that. We understand that and we value uh, everything you do. President Spraga says if the governor's budget is approved, there's a strong possibility BCC will not raise fees for students next year. And that is good news. The 2012-2013 basketball season is over with mixed results for the Bees. The women's team made the postseason for the first time in history, ending the season with a record of 7-8. and eight. The men's squad got off to a rough start and finished 6-16. Six and 16. Time to profile another alum of Bristol Community College. This month we talked to a New Bedford City Councilor who realized she needed to return to school to better handle her role as a public servant. I'm Deborah Coelho and I'm a BCC graduate of uh, 2009 and I am also a city councilor at large for New Bedford. I am an immigrant. I came uh, to New Bedford at the age of five with my family in the pursuit of the American dream, uh, which so many immigrants uh, still have that dream today. And uh, basically, uh, a traditional Portuguese family uh, grew up in the old uh, New Bedford neighborhood, uh, worked really hard even as a child. Uh, that's what we did. And uh, then I went through uh, the New Bedford school system and learned as much as I, I, I possibly could. I wanted to be an American. That's the one thing I always wanted to be as a child. As a kid, I was uh, very creative. I mean, I grew up in, uh, surrounded by a uh, sewing room. That's what my mother did. So fabrics, uh, anything having to do with sewing, creativity. Uh, within school, I was already making uh, theater props uh, that were required. Uh, I was big on photography. And uh, I took as many uh, classes as I could in photography in school. And that had, that had a big interest for me, the way I, I looked at things. And um, I, I think that I was more into the arts than anything else. Uh, I was massively into the arts, and New Bedford was very inspiring to me. As I grew in the arts and I, I graduated, I, I had like two interests. I had interest in government, and I had interest, well, when I say government, I meant like local government, local community. I had a big interest in that because at the same time when I was 19 years old, I opened up my own business. Uh, you know, a bridal shop. And so that was the first time that brought interaction with the community uh, because the community wasn't delivering the services that I needed to, to uh, you know, grow in my own business. And so I kind of felt like, oh, what's going on here? So I became involved in, in community groups and neighborhood groups. And I started to see how government uh, works and I started uh, demanding services that weren't being met and I started doing that on a regular basis. I ran that business for uh, well over uh, 20 years and then basically what happened um, I became so involved with being an activist because that was what I was referred to and I was doing a lot of, of deliveries here and here for in behalf of the community right here in these chambers. Within a few years people started telling me that they, I really should run for office. And I didn't quite know what that meant. I didn't know what it entailed. I didn't have any formal education. So I ran for office uh, because people were really telling me I should do this. So I kind of said, all right, let me see what that is. And then to my surprise, uh, I won. I had everything that brought me here, 
But once you're here, this is about policy, this is about creating ordinances, this is about making laws and keeping everybody safe. And I said, okay, I, um, I need help. And that's uh, within that same month that I got elected, um, I walked in through the doors at BCC right downtown New Bedford. And I said, uh, I want to do this. I want to take classes and learn. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and that's how I decided to go back to school. Because I had lived such a sheltered life in the city of New Bedford, I basically had not left New Bedford. I, <laughs> I worked out of the house, because that's where I had the home business. Uh, I worked within the community. So I really hadn't left New Bedford. Going to Fall River was not something that I was ready for. As silly as it might sound, it's just right over, <laughs> you know, really close by. But for somebody that is a non-traditional student, uh, who didn't have any formal education, who was afraid to leave the city. Uh, it seemed like a big world. So to have, uh, you know, a satellite campus here, well, it wasn't, that, I mean, it's a full-pledged campus uh, downtown, uh, was very comfortable for me. And I try to take uh, most of the, my classes there uh, within, like, the first year. And then I started venturing out uh, to the campus in Fall River, and I felt confident and like, okay, I know what this is now. I did graduate with honors. I was pretty excited about that. And um, I was encouraged by some of my professors to uh, move on. I thought that would, you know, I would get my two-year degree and I'd be happy. But I felt I needed more, so um, I did transfer, which was great because BCC allows you to transfer all your credits. And I moved on to, uh, to Bridgewater and I majored in both um, communications and political science. I have a, an interesting uh, personal life. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very non-traditional as far as uh, being, uh, you know, Portuguese. Uh, I didn't quite turn out to be a Portuguese housewife with, with children. Uh, my, I am married. My husband's very supportive uh, of my education, my career. Uh, he, he's not you know, I, I think especially being a, a woman in politics, it's, it's very different uh, for, for the husband. And, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's, it, it was a little hard to adjust, but we adjusted quite well. And um, I, I don't have any children personally, but I, I love children. I'm very open to, to children, and um, I feel very, I feel like every child in the city of New Bedford is my child because I have a, a sense of responsibility and duty uh, to them. There's organization that I didn't know was possible and that organizational skills here really make a big difference here. I mean, it's huge. Yeah, you can't even, I'm not even the same person that walked in here eight years ago when I first got elected and say, what is it that I won anyways? Because in actuality, I, I, you, uh, when, you, when you get elected, you really don't win anything. It's a service that you provide. And now more so than ever, because I'm educated, I can provide a better service to my constituency. And I, bec I become a better person to all those around me. So it, it's a huge difference. That's all for Around BCC this month. We leave you today with a look back at some of the highlights of the African American History Month activities held at BCC in February. There are more multicultural committee events at the college throughout this semester. Check out the BCC website for more. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for watching.